Um, I've been, I started in games in the very late 1970s as a teenager. I started in online services in 1982, back when dinosaurs roamed the internet, and have worked and started working with, uh, o with modern online services in working with East Asian companies and later with California companies starting in 2005 and 2009, respectively. This is a survey, this is a survey of the issues that cause problems or either lost opportunities or cause problems as we make the transition from product to product to service. Um, this is, I did an earlier version of this uh, with Ty, with, uh, Ty Kelly, who is the author of what, uh, the What Games Are column in, in um, TechCrunch. And um, we've boiled this down, and I've boiled this down to six categories. Programming, not as in engineering, but programming as uh, the, TV, the TV industry has done it. Deployment, direct marketing, monetization, analytics, and operations. This applies to anyone who is in the service business, including to the very largest and most successful companies. To choose some examples that you might want to keep in mind, which I believe all of you will know, let's choose two Finnish companies, Rovio and Supercell. Rovio came up with Angry Birds, which is arguably the greatest original IP to come out of the Western mobile, the Western mobile market. And Supercell, of course, has done Clash of Clans and Heyday and more recently Boom Beach. Rovio did Rovio they both have similar Genesis stories. They both did 40 or 50 mobile titles that failed before they delivered their great hits. If you look at how Rovio uh, developed Angry Birds, they did not fully get the service lessons and Supercell, which I had the privilege of working with that team um, when they were at Digital Chocolate bef in a previous incarnation, did. Now, in fairness to Rovio, Supercell came along 2-3 years later, so they had a chance to learn from their lessons. The single biggest transition that has taken us from products and services, atoms, that is, you know, boxes, cardboard boxes with shiny discs, to bits. This is, you know, this is for music. It was CD to streaming. For movies, again, there was a DVDs to streaming. There are several things that we have to unlearn as people who started in the pro in the product industry. One is that developers can be publishers. They could not be in the product environment. They needed intermediaries called publishers who had distributions with the brick and mortar distribution places or the mail order places. Post launch is much more important. It used to be that all of our effort went to, went to, went to delivering the game that shipped on that fixed date when the, when the shiny disc went out. And post-launch was dealing with the occasional complaint and so on, but all the development effort went there. The idea of operations, that is that you actually have to deal with an existing, with an, an existing audience, is again another key feature of services. And the last is that developers cannot avoid the business of games. Um, Ben Walsh asked the question at the end of Gordon's session about where, do, you know, where do you have to put marketing into the process? If you are not thinking about marketing as part of your game design, you will do less well in, the, in, in games as a service, and in some cases, significantly less well. We'll review that in a moment. Um, the programming decisions that you, have to uh, that you have to make. By the way, I will assume that most of you know almost everything some part of everything that each of these slides are going to cover. And I will just say about why you should listen to this is if all of you know this stuff, why aren't you doing, why aren't you doing it to the degree that you need to do? Um, and by the way, that criticism applies to the games that I've worked on. I may know this stuff, but it is hard to put all these pieces and to unlearn our, prod our product legacy. So first decision is do you do one title versus multiple titles? Again, uh, Rovio did an Angry Birds play and obviously has done very, very well. Supercell did multiple titles. The atomic unit of a title changes. In other words, you, don't do s you generally don't do sequels. You end up, in fact, it becomes hard to do sequels. You end up doing a game that, if it runs right, can run in theory indefinitely. Um, one of the earliest examples of this was the original Farmville, which went through, in its first 40 weeks, 42 different iterations, 42 distinctly different versions of Farmville. And when they, forgive, uh, uh, forgive, I'll use a technical term, when they fucked with it too much and made it a game that was less attractive, that's when they had to blow it up and do an, a, a next game. The next is the weight attaching to a title. 
the idea of the idea of minimum viable products simply did not exist in the product world. You could not send out a minimum viable product because uh, actually you could. It was called the remainder bin, but other than that, you could not send out a minimum viable product. In this field, you start and you know you want to make sure that your game hits its sweet spot when it becomes good enough at the point before you've chased away enough players. So there's a gamble that you play when you put out a lesser, a so-called lesser version or a lesser featured version, which is uh, which is that you're gambling that you will get a, that you will you, the people you will lose because you don't have the full features when you launch it are fewer than the people who will stay with it by the time the reinforcements arrive and you figure out how to do it right. Um, Business parameters have greater weight. This is one of the hardest lessons for people who are traditional game people. The monetization model matter has to be in the original design. The marketing has to be in the original design. Uh, those people who do not get that fail. I mean, to give you an idea, now to give you, uh, to give you guys a bit of a, f a free pass, for 20 to 25 years, the games industry had the same damn model. Had all, had actually, it had two models. One was, you send out a box, if it gets bought at the point of sale for $50 or $60 or the adjusted price and does not come back in 48 hours, there was a 96 to 98% sell-through rate. That rate did not vary for over 15 years. So in other words, in effect, your customer was saying that, they, that, that you, your financial incentive was not to have the customers play it, your, custo your incentive was to get them to buy it and not return it. The service model, t you actually have to be a bit more honest. You actually actually get the customers to play it to be able to keep it. It changes expectations, which is why business is so important. The second model is one that Gordon referenced, the MMO model of 9.95 a month, 12.95 a month. There you did have to, there you did have to get the customers to play it, but a little bit less so. And the last issue is franchise development, and franchises can mean two things. You can own. You can own the you can own the shooter uh, business, or you can own the Angry Birds and sequels and so on. It is harder for reasons that we won't have time to discuss to do franchise development in mobile, or at least so far, uh, at least up until 2014. On deployment, the first thing you have to think about is the paradigm of the player relationship to the device. the The most common mistake is people say they're designing for mobile. Well, the relationship someone has with a four and a half inch screen on a smartphone is very different from the relationship that they have with a tablet, which runs perhaps 12, 13, 14 inches. The platform, um, you know, whether that's iOS or Android or various other territories. The territories, how ambitious are you going to be in terms of what markets you serve? Are you going to go after the Anglosphere? Are there differences in the Anglosphere? Um, are you going to be the primary publisher? Or are you going to work with partners? You know, uh, when generally with Western companies, they worry about it when they're dealing with Asia. And then the thing that you get to do staging. The in the um, in the theater business, uh, plays used to be staged in New Haven before they came, and they would figure out where they work before they came to the Great White Way. Here we do it in and the three countries I name over here. The Philippines is the is the uh, low average income market. Ireland is the is the generally is the stand-in for the EU, and and Canada is the uh, is basically the new haven to the U.S. Direct marketing, we focus on acquisition because we spend so much money on it, you know, buying users and so on and so forth, and we spend some time on customer service, as the as the, as Lynn said at the last session, you know, we we know we have to deal with angry customers or people who want to communicate with us. But there is a 150-year-old discipline called direct marketing, which there are lots of people who know how to do uh, very well. American Express does it very well. Publishers Clearinghouse does it very well. Um, your bank does it very well. And it is about acquisition, retention, upsell, and customer service. Um, again, I did a talk on direct marketing. I'll recommend to you um, Drayton Bird's uh, Common Sense Direct and Digital Marketing. It is a book that the first edition was written uh, was written before the before the internet was w was commercialized, and when he wrote the internet chapters later, they turned out just to say that the internet is one of the greatest mediums ever invented for direct marketing. The reason why you should spend time more time on retention, upsell, and customer service is the majority of your competitors are not doing it. So there's at least an arbitrage opportunity. 
but there's a great deal of knowledge about direct marketing. There are, there, it is a 50 to $100 billion world by b business. Read it and study it. It applies to, ga to games as a service, and it particularly applies to free-to-play games. Monetization. Um, the thing that we've heard at many Casual Connects and many other fine conferences is we're going to put the fun in, or we're going to put the quality, we're going to make the great game, and then we're going to work the monetization, the monetization model. We have now had um, several tens of thousands of games who have proved that if you do not figure out the monetization as part of the game design, you will fail. And in fact, there's been a whole series of, of well-loved games um, from the 80s and 90s and early 2000s that have tried to go in and take, that were built for the old monetization model and haven't made the flip over. Um, if you read what happened with the, with the relaunch of Dungeon Keeper, I'm sorry, I'm going to pick on one, uh, on, on one game, you can get, there, there are many, many sad examples of what happens when you don't think about monetization at the, be at the beginning. Um, there's enough roadkill out there so you can try and avoid being it yourself. Um, again, the, uh, the so in terms of the dark arts, well, when we are now at the point where we actually have to get people to pay, and in fact we have to get a small minority to pay to make things go, we start keeping bad company. We start going into bad neighborhoods. Ad networks. I counsel many of the companies I work with about how how that is basically a. Um, that is basically a race towards margin wars and, s and, sh and shady practices because the ad networks have to promise 150% of what they actually have to sell. Um, then the question becomes, to what extent do you go to the dark side yourself? Now, all of you, I'm sure, love games, are in this business because you love games to death, but when you're trying to figure out whether or not the game is going to fail, it's amazing the morally convenient decisions that people will make. Think about, the, think about this, and again, there is a lot of object lessons because th there's an entire ad network business out there that's very well covered and very well referenced on the internet. Payment methods, um, you know, Visa, PayPal, Bitcoin, the simplest way is some of them have a, have a rescission rate of under 5%. That means 5% of the people who claim they paid you actually didn't. Some of them has uh, as high as 50%. If that, if that spread doesn't bother you, then God bless. Um, the types of payment decides the games, ads and subscriptions, and then you have to manage your providers. You have to keep them, you have to keep them honest. Analytics. In, in, in a, you know, for those of you who have had small children, you, you'll discover when they, they find a word they like, they keep repeating it. Well, the word that the games industry learned about two years ago was analytics. And one of the key problems over here is, is analytics the master of the servants of publishing? Let me pick on Farmville for a second time. Um, Zynga, in the early days of social games, had perhaps the finest Western analytics uh, operation going, and in fact, there were some things they did. There was a high point, which I don't have uh, time to do. But they made those changes to Farmville's based on very good real-time reporting analytics. But what they did was they made changes each week based on tactical stuff. And what happened is they kept changing for the most vocal, the, mo the, the, the highest paying. And what they did is they made a game where they did not franchise the silent majority, and they did not enfranchise the people who didn't want to pay right now. And they turned it into a giant. They turned it into a giant roach trap. Farmville One is the is probably the best case study for finding out what happens when you let analytics run, run the show. Analytics can overtake design. Let's A B test everything. Um, yes, the yes testing is extraordinarily important for understanding what people do, but if you do not have a a certain minimum creative take, if you will, a soul of the game. And if you allow analytics to take it over, then you're going down the risk. Th then that you're going down Gordon's little risk, um, you know, clone route, and you will eventually be someone who is playing an also ran. Analysts are, uh, ha exhibit toxic behavior when both when you're failing because then they then they tell you this is what you're doing wrong without telling what you need to be doing, and when you're succeeding. They basically, as I described with Farmville, keep reinforcing the behavior that captured the last customers, not the next customers. Um, going, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to blitz through this a little bit 
fast because we started a little bit late. Um, on operations, um, if you uh, if you uh, put more end up putting more resources into game development before you launch, you are essentially saying your game probably failed. Um, in the product world, the development effort was all before the thing went out because that was it. In this one, if you have a successful game, it's going to stick around for a while and more and more money and more resources will be get put after the launch. Um, operations evolves on an as-needed basis. Do not build a entire operations team anticipating everything that happens. The players will do things that you didn't expect. Also, you will end up making some compromises as the game that comes out will not be the game that you spec'd when you did the operations. Um, you have to have uh, commingling of functions. The operations people have to work with the other side. Marketing, business development, operations all have to work with design. If you run these in silos, we've seen enough examples of why these things fail. Soft launches, Gordon discussed earlier, but the any service organization thinks about operations that affects almost everything that they do. Okay, so just to briefly recap, and again, uh, apologies for going through this at, at something close to freight train speed. Your programming is your business strategy. In other words, the titles that you put together, how you put together, when you launch it, the size of the launches, that is a business strategy. So in other words, what was the old R&D function is, is basically your business strategy if you are a developer or publisher. Um, Make sure that you match the staff and the games and the structure to the use case. If you're doing an F2P game, then get people, then get people who know how to do F2P games and make sure the mechanics reward F2P. On marketing, you're in the relationship business. In other words, you are developing relationship with your, as much relationship with your users and your customers as you can afford and you want to basically build s more and stronger relationships over time because they will give you their time and their money. Um, an unnatural monetization fit is a recipe for disaster. Uh, again, I gave the example, but w again, any game design, um, you know, any game design has got to start by saying, what behaviors does the game reward and what behaviors do we need in monetization? What is the condition of this thing staying in business and this staying published? Analytics are the servants, not the master. One lesson from uh, that, that actually Zynga got very well after recovering from Farmville is they understood that, that analysts themselves could give you data, but you needed people who understood the process of doing games to be able to interpret the analytics, to know when to freelance fr fr from it, when to ignore it, and when, and when to apply it. And the last is that operations are evolution in action. That is to say, operations start with a skeleton staff or an initial effort, and then they evolve based on how the player base comes together and as the game develops. Anyway, thank you, and um, if you would like, um, since I did not cover every bullet point and I went through it fairly fast, please do not hesitate to email me and I will be happy to send you a copy, a copy of this. And, um, and as long as you don't scream at me, I'll be happy to ask questions about it too. But in the meantime, I'll take questions here. So, uh, hi Eric. So, uh, we're finding as we as we evolve from this from Gordon's seven person company to 96 people now that this has happened like we've had to make adjustments to our operation structure or, uh, the way we build products many times over the over over the past 3 years you know how how does this evolve as the company evolve you know at what point should i be looking at uh, you said some of these things like the monetization piece and the piece you should be looking at before you start building your product is this but are some of these things keyed as a company gets bigger? Are some of these keyed on success? Are some of these, like how does it all factor together? A uh, company that's growing. All right, for a company that's growing, one of the biggest issues, uh, the, the, well, as you know, Monty, the biggest, the biggest driver as you get larger and larger is the number of people who are in customer service. That is, the, you know, with any online operation, when they get, you know, the classic examples, when AOL was uh, 13,000 people in the 1990s, 8,000 of their people were CSRs. Now, there wasn't as much automation, 
So we are able to have those 8,000 might be able to be handled by 1,500 or 2,000 with modern tools right here. So customer service related tasks will become the become an ever increasing part of what you have to do once you crack around the 100, the 100 barrier. Um, in terms of the in terms of monetization, that's actually going to be a relatively small crew. The support for monetization, that is, you know, doing things like being able to deal with frauds and charges and so on and so forth, is very significant, especially because you're dealing with about as close to real money as you get. Uh, Monty's company does social, ca does social casino, which is why I'm putting an, emphas an emphasis on that. The other area that, uh, the, the other area that gets heavy is the, um, is the development area, which is doing the little tweaks, the things that make Candy Crush Saga really great is they do, they do hundreds of little tweaks to the levels and so on and so forth. And given that you're dealing with so things that are well understood forms of games, slots and so on and so forth, you want to be looking at all the little tweaks that make a quarter of a percent difference. Um, and in fact, in that regard, you are not, you are not dissimilar to Amazon, which actually has a has its third largest group are the people who do the, the tweaks on the individual <laughs> slides and so on and so forth. Sir? Uh, <coughs> excuse me, could you say a little bit more about the ad networks? I, I think my takeaway was that we should avoid them, but I'm, I'm not quite sure what all of your thinking was behind that. I'm sorry, I am not, uh, uh, thank you for asking that because I was not saying you should avoid them. But we've been through three recent cycles. I'll go through one that's ended because I can pick on it. But um, in the social game, the early social game era, the Facebook and MySpace era, what happened was um, uh, Zynga, Playdom, uh, Playfish, and so on, all started playing the ad networks against, against each other. Um, so they ended up having to drop their margins and they ended up in a situation where as new people rushed into the business, they, you know, they would have an audience, of the example I use is 20% really, really good potential customers, 20% okay customers, 30% eh, and 30% garbage. And what happens is that the ad networks would be under pressure to deliver more people than they could, so they would start delivering the worst customers to the people who were paying less attention. So I am s ad networks are an extraordinarily part important part of the ecosystem, and I apologize for my unclarity on that. Um, but to be able to operate effectively, if you do not, if you're not able to watch them and keep them honest, or let me even be more positive, if you're not able to understand to understand what they do and they don't, and have them match to your game, then you will uh, then you will not do as well. And we are out of time. Thank you all for coming and.